hope you guys can see my screen. Yes. All right. So the topics, as I said, uh, the flow of topics will be, uh, we're discussing about the CCS on the cardiothoracic surgery. And then we'll discuss just gist of the things that you need to have some grasp for the exam. A little bit of um, uh, intricacy in IBP tracing and pacing. That was a request from most of the candidates. So they're not long presentation, but I will try to highlight the important points in it. Now, the first vignette that uh, people who have appeared the exam, they can refer to their questions, but for the people who are guests, so I would read through the vignette. So this is a 71 year male who was admitted to the ICU post mitral valve replacement with left atrial appendage ligation. He has a background of rheumatic heart disease, atrial fibrillation, and was on warfarin, which was stopped five days ago. He was maintained on heparin infusion in the hospital before the surgery. His left ventricular ejection fraction was low normal with moderate RV dysfunction. His pulmonary artery systolic pressure was 65 millimeter of mercury. And on admission to the ICU after the surgery, following are the vitals for him. This is the chest X-ray. Um, as you can see, the usual lines and uh, tubes for the cardiac surgical patient. His heart rate was 60. It was a paced rhythm, which was a VVI. Blood pressure was 80 by 46. CVP of 2 millimeter of mercury. He is on a controlled mode PRVC ventilation with a FIO2.5, tidal volume of 500 ml. The plateau pressure that is recorded on the ventilator was 24. He has two chest drains as evidence in the X-ray, one in the left pleura and one in the mediastinum. The drain output since arrival to the ICU in last one hour was 250 ml. He is currently on three microgram per minute of noradrenaline infusion. The admission ABG and chest X-ray are as following. So this is the chest X-ray. As you can see, there is a mitral valve replacement prosthesis. Uh, there are usual endotracheal tube central line few ECG leads, and there is faintly, we can see the two drains in there. Um, the ABG is next. So he has this ABG, which has a normalish pH uh, and a acceptable PaO2. Uh, visibly, the calcium is low or slightly low. 1.06 is the ionized calcium. It is low. Hemoglobin of 120, and rest of the parameter are more or less within normal limit. Now, the first question that you asked, uh, you were asked, so these are the question on the, this column and these are the suggested answer. You may answer something else. If if you your answer is rational and fits to the circumstance, then you will be given a mark. Uh, it's not that your answer has to be within this five, but usually um, the answers that are there, they tick off that, but some, sometimes they may miss an answer in the answer sheet or the answer grid. And if you answer it correctly, then you may get a mark for that. So the first question was, what was the possible causes of shock in this patient? As you can see, his blood pressure was 80 by 60. So what are the possible causes of shock? The answer, again, a structure approach. Whenever there is a question on shock, you talk about all the five possible causes, which is relevant to that clinical context. So the first is cardiogenic. He had a post-cardiac surgery. So most commonly it is a stunt myocardium. Also the pacing was only at 60. So maybe a low heart rate leading to a low cardiac output state. That may be the cause of that. There are chances of an obstructive um, uh, cause, of, uh, cause of shock, which includes a tamponade or a pneumothorax. But there was no obvious pneumothorax in the chest X-ray. But you cannot rule out a tamponade based on the chest X-ray. Uh, it can be a hemorrhagic shock. Uh, if the patient is coagulopathic or if there are ongoing sur surgical bleeding, it can be vasoplegic, like post-pump inflammatory state, deworming and ongoing sedatives that can cause a vasoplegia or a vasoplegic state. And also the patient can be hypervolumic. So these are the five important causes of shock. Whenever there is a question, if they ask you about what are the causes of shock, in that case, you have to have five differentials because all of them will take one mark, right? So people will answer haphazardly saying, oh, he can have a stunned myocardium. It can be the drug effect. It can be hypovolemia. But usually if you answer in a structured manner, 
then it is quick to answer and you, you can tick off all the boxes and score high in the exam. The second question, how will you distinguish each type of shock? So this is usually the sequence of questions on shock. If, if they ask you what type of shock, then how do you differentiate between the shock or the causes of shock? Again, you started with the types of shock and you go to the differential. So cardiogenic shock, you differentiate by a transthoracic echo or a toe, depending on the situation. Obstructive shock, pneumothorax, you can do a bedside ultrasound or chest x-ray. Tamponade, again, can be ruled out by a TTE or a TOE, uh, chest x-ray or a narrow pulse pressure on, uh, on, the, on the monitor. Hemorrhagic shock, the patient can have over bleeding or occult bleeding that can be found out with x-ray or if you put a probe or a toe, you can see some uh, blood around the heart or in the in the pleural cavity. Then hypovolemic shock can be differentiated again with the, or, or, or looking at a CVP, this is not a good marker of it. Um, now, the third question was, how will you manage this case? Sanatan, so, can, I, can I interrupt yeah, you please, just please. one minute? Uh, add, add, add a few things here and there. Um, yeah. uh, before I before I uh, um, add in a few points, just wanted to know, Sanatan, uh, what was the underlying valve pathology? You said it was rheumatic heart disease. Was it yeah. a mitral regurgitation or a mitral stenosis? The X-ray doesn't clearly represent uh, a patient with mitral stenosis that way. But yeah. I'm just curious to know what what was your underlying um, valve lesion. So it's a mixed mitral disease, both with MR and MS. Um, he has a, uh, the patient has a large um, left atrium, which mm -hmm. with a long-standing AF for that, and he was anticoagulated with warfarin. So mixed mitral disease because of the rheumatic heart disease. Yeah, yeah. fair enough. And I think, you know, you, you had a valid point when you started off with question one, and it just pertains not just to cardiac surgery, but for all those who are going to take up the EDIC exam, any cause of shock under any circumstance, under any pretext or any other different context, you will have to uh, figure out um, your differentials in terms of these five broad headings. And I think that's, that's clearly expected at your level as to how you correlate each of these different of shocks to your particular scenario that is given. Um, the idea is have a broad outlook into the various causes of shock, and then you narrow down yourself based on all these bedside investigations to one or two kinds of shock. Sometimes you may get a mixed shock as well. So you might get a picture of mixed shock and you, you'll have to treat sometimes two kinds of shock at the same time. So the idea is think broad, narrow down eventually to your diagnosis. And that's exactly what will be expected of you even in the exam. So essentially, you know, as long as you have drawn or you have sent your um, uh, differentials broadly, it'll be easy for the examiner to get you to what he wants. If you have not included any of these differentials, it becomes different, difficult for the examiner to pull it out of your mouth as to what cause he's looking for. Uh, again, when you come to question two as to distinguishing each shock type, clearly, you know, these are clinical ways of distinguishing it. Um, the other common thing that usually gets inserted in exams for distinguishing each shock type uh, would be hemodynamic variables. So things like PA pressure readings, um, CVP readings, arterial phase readings, and your cardiac output, cardiac index in this context. So you should know at least what happens with all these numbers in cardiogenic shock versus obstructive shock versus hypovolemic shock. Um, and, and if you have additional parameters, um, you should know how these hemodynamic parameters vary and you may be able to zoom in to a particular type of shock straight away. And then the case will proceed on those lines as to discussing the management of that particular kind of shock. Thanks, Anathan. Thank you, Dr. Ramanathan. The very valid point. So uh, you will face the taste of hemodynamic in our hemodynamic module. So um, it was knowingly left out the waveforms, but 
definitely mm -hmm. this will be a part of this CCS. So um, they will show you some sort of uh, cardiac output monitoring uh, numbers and ask you to differentiate what type of shock is that. Right. Now continuing with the question, question number three, how will you manage this case? So usual flow of questions. So they will ask about the differential, then about uh, how you distinguish and then how you manage. So the patient was uh, relatively bradycardic at 60, so it can increase the pacing rate to 80 or 90, whatever number you can put there. You can do a bedside echo to look at the as is the preload, and uh, uh, if he's preload deficient, then you can fluid load the patient. Uh, if he has a new onset LV dysfunction, which can be ischemic or can be due to the stunt myocardium, um, uh, you, and, and the patient may need inotropy, so you can suggest some inotropy in there if required. And then the most important thing is to rule out a obstruct, obstructive cause uh, of shock because of tamponade. Uh, Transthoracic echo may not be the best option, but it is a starting point. So um, the second thing you need to have a look at the heart with the echo. Then if there is ongoing shock, then you probably aim to reduce the sedative because they may be contributing to the hypotension for the patient. If you think the bleeding is more than expected, that patient has 250 ml of uh, blood coming out in first hour and he's shocked, so you are worried about the bleeding, then you may send some point of care uh, testing for coagulation parameter. Uh, whatever in your unit. So in, in my place or in this side of the wall, they usually use the rotum. So rotum guided correction if there is a uh, ongoing coagulopathy. Uh, then you titrate your vasopressor depending on what, what sort of target you are um, um, trying to achieve. Mean natural pressure of 60, 65, give a number. Um, and I'll titrate my vasopressor accordingly and rule out other, other possible contributing causes. Suppose someone is on steroid and he may require steroid supplement because uh, cardiac surgery and going into a pump is a stressful situation and he may be deficient with some uh, uh, glucocorticoids, so you can supplement that. So doesn't have you, you, your answers doesn't have to be all the eight points, but it should not miss few important things for that patient whose heart rate was clearly not adequate at 60. So this is an important point. You need to rule out the uh, tamponade. And if there is a tamponade, then act accordingly. That's the another point to mark. And other cause of, ble other cause of shock is a bleeding. So you should evaluate bleeding. And you must be uttering about a point of care evaluation of coagulation parameter, whether it is a take or a rotum. So these are the important things that you have to have in your answer. As you can see, we have given five marks out of eight, whichever you can tick off. So we expect for a patient who passes the exam would tick off four or five points out of that. All right, going to the next uh, vignette. So this is the vignette two. Um, again, point of anything at this point, uh, Dr. Ramanathan. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, sorry, Dr. Sanan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all right. Okay. Yeah, uh, only one point I would add um, just a mm -hmm. tip to uh, all the exam going. Whenever you are asked about management, and, you know, if this applies to any question that is asked to you, um, there is a saying care, you classify or you die nicely. So, essentially, you know, any question, as much as you are organized with your answers, it will be nice. And to get organized with your answers, it's best that you classify your answers into subheadings. So questions on management, I usually tell my friends and fellows to classify them as diagnostic and treatment purposes. So diagnostic and therapy. So essentially, you know, management questions you can you can clearly answer by um, uh, getting them into two headings. These will be my diagnostic steps. These will be my treatment approach. So you have you, you you have it in your head. It'll be easy for you to come out with the answers uh, when you are asked. Right. Yeah, that's that's the other way of uh, um, approaching it. So the way Dr. Ramanathan is suggesting is probably the best way because you do not miss things in there. And the examiner knows about you have something in your head regarding a classification. You look for a specific diagnostic approach and then management approach. Then you again find out the management as general management and specific management. Even if you are running out of time, you are not able to um, touch all the point, but 
the examiner has a feeling that you knows about it. You know, you, the, the candidate knows about it and he, he is well prepared because of lack of time or something he's not able to, then he's more interested in your answer and he may stop you. Okay, okay, that's fine. I know that you are going in the right track. We'll go to the next question. This is most commonly a common thing that can happen in the exam where the examiner is impressed by your classification or your approach of answer rather than the particular answer. So uh, the way you frame your answer uh, not only it gives you a good productivity, also it helps you to remember things. You do not forget important things if you classify them in the beginning. Now, um, going to the second vignette. So the patient has ongoing bleeding with increased output from the drains and he is also woozy at the drain insertion sites. His rotem demonstrated the following. Uh, the abnormality here are in the pink, which is usually how the system is coded. So you can see in the fifth term, um, the A5 is four, which is less than the usual value of seven or eight, depending on where you are practicing. Um, and uh, the patient is bleeding. So he's coagulopathic due to some cause uh, associated there. And the bleeding is a major cause of shock. According to this question, that's what they mean here. And again, this question will follow to interpret the, interpret the rotum or a tech curve and how do you treat the patient in that case? So the question is, what is the abnormality you can see? And what are what is your next management plan? Now, the important thing in this uh, slide, or the slide earlier, is that you need to talk about the most important thing. You cannot talk about, yes, the A5 is uh, low, but the plotting time is increased, the A10 is low, and then the uh, formation time is decreased and all those things, everything you cannot talk of. So important thing to know is in a, in a, in a point of care uh, coagulation study, what you need to talk about, right? So first of all, important thing, what type of time there in the road time, you have a fifth time, you should be talking about A5 or A10, right? In the X time, you should be talking about uh, the CT and 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 if you have an issue with the A5 and A10 again. Again, in the heptem, uh, so it doesn't have an heptem. So uh, again, in the in the heptem also or uh, heptem or in time, you should be talking about the clotting time and whether it is corrected or not. So you cannot tell all the all the variables that these are the abnormal because anybody can see that the abnormal value is in in the pink or in the red. But interpretation of the rotum is important. So for this patient, fifth term is the first thing you see. The A5 is low. That means he is deficient in fibrinogen. That's why he is coagulopathic. That's the first step, right? So that's what the question is asking next. What is the abnormality you can see? The rotum shows fibrinogen deficiency. What is your next management plan? So what is what, what are the fibrinogen uh, substitute or what, what is the preparation that you can give? So the answer is will require fibrinogen concentrate. If you are, if you don't have that in your practice, then it is the cry precipitate will be the answer. And then you repeat the rotum after the fibrinogen is uh, replaced after 15 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, so this this will be the answer for that. So straightforward one mark each for that, right? Now going to vignette three. So post rotum based correction, the bleeding slowed down. The noradrenaline requirement went, still it went up, up to 20 microgram per minute. Initially he was on three microgram, now he's on 20 mics. And he was started on vasopressin to maintain the systolic blood pressure at 90 and a map of 60 to 65. So definitely the shock has an improved even if the coagulation has been corrected. His CVP is now rose to 13. It was initially two or three. We can remember from the question. So it has gone up to 13 millimeter of mercury with only 200 ml of crystalloid loading. Repeat blood gas shows worsening metabolic acidosis with a pH of 7.14 by carb of 12 and lactate of 4.8 millimoles. Uh, his last hour urine output has dropped to 15 ml and his current vitals are as uh, below. So we have increased the rate to BVI to 80. He's paced now. His blood pressure is 88 by 70 with a narrow pulse pressure, as you can see there. The saturation is 100% with FiO2.4. He is on 20 of my, 20 mics of NORAD and full uh, 0.05%. So overall, the vignette says that there is a worsening shock in spite of the correction of the coagulopathy. So in addition to coagulopathy, something else is happening that is driving that shock. 
the vitals that has shown has a narrow pulse pressure that sorry yeah um, so in the vitals you can see um, the uh, there is a narrow pulse pressure of 80 and the patient is having raised lactate and decreased urine output so all these signs pointing towards the usual course for a uh, hypotensive shock patient in a cardiothoracic surgery that's a tamponade so that should ring the bell with a narrow pulse pressure rising lactate and the patient is shocked uh, the question is will flow like that so what is your next plan of action so the diagnosis is possibly i need to rule out a tamponade here so bedside 2d equal to look for tamponade and if the patient needs fluid just interrupting uh, sir, sir, sir yeah, uh, yeah. sorry uh, I request uh, Galaxy A02, please mute your mic. It's interrupting and uh, like it's uh, disturbing others. Thank you. Uh, thank yeah, you. Please mute all of your mic uh, because uh, Dr. Sananta uh, is getting a little bit distracted in the sound. So, and uh, everybody is actually having disturbance in understanding also. I am getting message from like no people. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Now, the patient has possible tamponade. So how do you rule in or rule it out by a uh, echocardiography, whether you have a facility to do an immediate toe or a, to start with a 2D echo, both are fine. And also look for uh, the fluid status of the patient and contractility. If you think it is a tamponade, then it needs a urgent surgical referral and preparedness for chest reopening, depending on the unit protocol, right? So that should be the standard answer uh, for that. Now the question seven, as they have started the tamponade, they will go into the details of the tamponade. So describe the tamponade physiology and how do you explain the raised lactate here? So this, this, this is only a sample question for tamponade. There may be quite a lot of questions around it. So what is the echo finding in tamponade? Um, how do you manage tamponade? What is the procedure in doing a, a percutaneous uh, pericardiosynthesis? All these questions can be added on to that. So you need to know a little bit of uh, little bit around tamponade, how it is managed, what are the signs in uh, of tamponade in the echo. All these questions can be uh, a, can be added to the main question. So in this case, we thought we'll add the uh, physiology behind the tamponade, what happens with tamponade, and how will you explain the lactate here. So the physiology, I mean, you can you can say that there is collection of blood in the pericardium, which is a limited space and there is, which is non-expandable after a certain extent and which if the blood collection collects there, then it, it restricts the atrial and ventricular filling. Uh, mechanically, it compresses those chambers. So there is decreased filling into the atrium and the preload decreases. And also there is equalization of pressure in all chambers. This is most important that line you have to utter about. So there is equalization of pressure in all the chambers. There is decreased forward flow of the heart. So there is decreased cardiac output. The cause of lactate, there will be multiple causes to that. First of all, raised lactate is due to a low perfusion state. It can be due to a congestive hepatopathy, um, or you can tell the patient or the background of somebody with alcohol or somebody on metformin to start with, these are the possible causes. But you must say about low perfusion state and possible consistent hepatopathy because of right heart dysfunction or back pressure because of the tamponade. Uh, so, so these are all, yeah. Yeah, I'll just uh, uh, one or two points to add here. So yeah. again, starting from the main stem, which was a post-cardiac surgical patient, you need to understand that the direction of discussion can go anywhere. So there, have, there are many arrows here. The most common ones that examiners like to pick out are post-operative or post-cardiac surgical bleeding. Um, so Sanatan D, uh, I mean, like, you know, he briefly touched upon that point, but you can understand that it can be a full stem discussing about bleeding, bleeding management, blood products, eventually going on to, you know, somewhere else. So that is one possible stem that can arise from this big uh, heading. The other thing is, again, in a cardiac surgical patient, which usually gets discussed is tamponade. Again, you know, as, as he rightly pointed out, he's highlighted some of the important questions that can be asked in a patient who's got tamponade. The third thing, the third stem that usually comes out is a post-op atrial fibrillation. Again, you know, how you manage it, what are the... I mean, the, I mean, pharmacotherapy versus cardioversion, 
again, you know, things like um, all, all, all those things pertaining to AF risk factors and all those stuff, it can go into that stem as well. And of course, last but not the least, you know, sometimes you, you can also be asked about post-cardiac surgical patients who develop cardiac arrest in the ICU. Again, you know, that's another stem by itself. So if you think broadly, these are some of the common problems that gets, not just gets discussed in exams, but also you face clinically. And, and again, you know, examiners usually pertain to the most common causes. They don't go to the rarest causes of all this. So um, be aware of some of these common complications in the immediate post-surgical period. Thank you, Dr. Ramanathan. So yes, it can branch out to multiple stems. So um, that's why in the beginning I said, it's not about the question, it is the way you answer the question. So um, going to the further we need four, the patient had a PA cardiac arrest in next five minutes because of the tamponade. Now enumerate your priorities. So it can be a gross general question like enumerate your priorities, which what are the things you need to do in a prioritized manner. So in that case, it goes to a very basic management options like ensure 100% oxygen, disconnect the pacing to ensure that there is no VF, under, underlying VF. That's the usual usual pathway for a cardiac arrest in post-cardiac arrest and uh, post-cardiac surgery patient. If there is a VF, then shock the patient and start CPR and get ready for immediate chest opening. Inform the surgical and anesthetic team, arrange for blood and blood products, and rule out the reversible causes, which includes the 5Hs and Ts. So the aim of this question is, as a person appearing the EDIC exam, you should be pre-aware of the algorithm for a cardiac arrest in post-cardiac surgery. The principle is same, but there are a few intricacies, some changes, compared to the adult ACLS or whatever ARC guideline, there are a few, few things that is different in a post-cardiac arrest uh, patient who had a cardiac surgery that you need to know. That's the basic aim for, for this question. I wanted to highlight, you should go uh, and read that. That is attached in your study material. So make sure that you read that paper or read that uh, position statement from ESICM. That is very, very important because it is produced by uh, the European society there, and they may ask you on that. So uh, they may straight away pick up that there is a recommendation for three stacked shock if the patient has a shockable rhythm in, in cardiac surgery, post-cardiac surgery, cardiac arrest, which is not a recommendation in the ACLS. Uh, you usually don't give a full dose of adrenaline. Uh, you usually give smaller aliquots of 50 to 100 mics of adrenaline. Uh, the first preference is to defibrillate the patient if you have a defibrillator ready to attach within a minute or so because the chest is already being, uh, there is sternotomy and you may cause more damage to the patient rather than helping the patient. Then you detach all the pacing to see if there is a VF, um, underlying slow VF um, that you are missing, which may be amenable to immediate defibrillation rather than going for straight away chest compression. So there are a few difference between um, uh, the resuscitation and CPR in a post-cardiac arrest patient who had a cardiac surgery compared to a non-cardiac surgery patient who has a cardiac arrest. So you need to know the differences between those two. That can be a direct question. Now, how quickly the opening should be achieved? So again, this is directly from that guideline, ideally within less than five minutes, which is almost always impractical, but that's the guideline. Uh, and if the achieved blood pressure is less than 60 by the uh, chest compression, you are not able to achieve a systolic blood pressure is less than 60, then you need to consider immediate chest opening in this patient. Uh, going to the next vignette, then it will go in the, in the sequence of uh, um, CPR in this patient. So the patient's rhythm regenerates into a ventricular fibrillation. So how will you manage? That's the first question. So three stack shock, as I said, this is the recommendation for the post-cardiac arrest patient in a post-cardiac surgery patient. So you give three stack shock for a, for a shockable rhythm at the beginning. What is the recommendation for adrenaline dose? So usually a smaller helicopter of 50 to 100 because there are chances of rebound hypertension. If you open the chest, the patient may have 
a very high blood pressure that can rupture your graft, that can rupture your anastomosis. So in those cases, we usually prefer 50 to 100 millivolts of adrenaline. But again, that is depends on the on the circumstances. But that's in the recommendation. That's what I'm talking about. How will you manage the ventilation? So 100% oxygen. Uh, there are recommendations that you change to bag valve uh, ventilation rather than keeping the patient on the ventilator. And um, if possible, you can switch off the PEEP because that can compromise your preload. So in the, these are the recommendations directly from the paper. But at least you can talk about 100% oxygen and change over to a bag valve mask rather than keeping the patient on the mechanical ventilator. How will you manage the patient if the patient has an IABP in situ in the event of cardiac arrest? So uh, nowadays, mo most of the IABP are auto-trigger, but uh, there is a line in that recommendation again, change it to a pressure trigger because there is no ECG to trigger that. So this is important. If the patient has an IABP in place and he arrested, then we change it to a pressure trigger unless it is in an in a auto-trigger mode. Um, now going to the, I think this is the last step, probably last but one minute. The anything, patients. Anything, sorry, uh, Dr. Sanan, anything at this point of time, Dr. Ramanathan? Um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, I think he's, he's highlighted most of the things uh, that I wanted to. I uh, also want to use this opportunity to let the candidates know that there are certain special situations where CPR guidelines change. You guys should be thoroughly aware of it. So CPR in pregnancy, CPR in children, CPR in hypothermia, CPR in cardiac surgery. These are some of the situations where we deviate from the normal guidelines. Um, and then, uh, you know, um, you should be aware of what the deviation is and what all the uh, conditions are. So uh, as long as you know this, it's, it's, it should be, otherwise uh, you should be able to answer these questions. Thank you, Dr. Ramanathan. So um, I'll bit, uh, uh, go fast because we are probably a bit slow to complete. Um, we need six. The patient has chest uh, reopening in the ICU and ROS was achieved. He returned to theater for re-exploration and bleeder was found and secured. He is now back in ICU. His current vasopressor and anotrope requirement has come down, or still, still at 25 microgram and vasopressin of 0 0.04. And he is back on adrenaline now 10 mics per kg. Um, his blood lactate level is measured and was reported to be 12. So it was earlier less than 12. It has gone up to 12. Again, I'm asking about what are the differentials for lactatemia. This is a very practical question because that's what you face and you need to know why the, where the lactate is coming from. It's not always the hypoperfusion that is causing it. So the first differential may be hypoperfusive state, but again, you have a sympathomimetic going on like adrenaline that can cause a rise in lactate. Again, congestive hepatopathy that we talked uh, talked about and ischemic hepatitis because of a low blood pressure that can happen. So I'm, I'm just highlighting one of the questions. It may not be asked in the exam, but there are various type of things that can come into picture. That's what the main, main thing that I'm putting in abnormal question here. Now I'm going into a bit of a lactate uh, why how the lactate um, is uh, uh, how the lactate gets elevated in a shock state so it is asking the next question is asking what's the physiology of hyperlactatemia due to adrenaline and what happens if you give adrenaline why the lactate goes up so a little bit of physiology that you need to know there is uncoupling of glycolysis with tca cycle and there is excessive glycolysis which cannot cope up uh, the TCA cycle cannot cope, cope up with the excessive glycolysis, so there is increased lactate upstream, um, which is uh, which represents as a high lactate in the blood and cause uh, can cause hyperlactatemia. So that's the mechanism of lactatemia in presence of adrenaline, and all the lactate are not always due to hypoperfusion. That's the message I want to uh, send here. Uh, Vignette seven. Um, on day two of the ICU stay, when the patient was turned for routine pressure, pressure area care, he became hypertensive with the immediate 12 lead ECG showing the following. So as you can see, this is 12 lead ECG. There are pacing present. Uh, you can see the pacing spikes, but not all the pacing spikes are captured. As you can see in the lead V6, there, there is no capture. You can see the spikes, but there is no QRS complex following it. So they can go into pacing after that, which is again, not uncommon for a cardiac surgery patient. 
the question was what abnormality can you detect in the ECG? That's a loss of ventricular capture. How will you manage this acute crisis? Two marks for explaining the points. So, in piece, so uh, there are different parts of pacemaker, um, and they can ask you different uh, scenarios regarding or involving a pacemaker. One of them is loss of capture. So, how do you manage a case of loss of capture? So, increase the pacemaker ventricular output to maximum and check for connection. If unable to capture with a non perfusing rhythm or BP rhythm or a low blood pressure, then the start CPR. You can consider external pacing with a maximal output and arrange for an immediate transvenous pacing for this patient because he is pacing dependent. And consider chest reopening if hemodynamics are unstable and you are not able to pace the patient for a good cardiac output. Again, if it is a cardiac arrest situation, then rule out the 5Hs and 5Ts and go to the cardiac arrest algorithm. So basically, the question was on how to manage a loss of capture situation. Now uh, that completes the um, whole CCS. Uh, I have few slides on what are the what are the um, possible uh, questions or what are the possible segments you have to have some knowledge about that can be asked in the exam. First of all, ECG is a very frequent question in the exam. And there are a variety of ECGs asked in the exam, but you should classify the type of ECG they are going to ask. So whether it is an ischemic type of ECG, whether it is related to heart blocks or arrhythmias, whether it is related to some sort of syndrome which includes WPW, Valenzine, Brigada, or hypothermia um, presentation, or whether ECG is related to left ventricular hypertrophy or PE. So there are not many classes of ECG. Overall, there are almost five classes of ECG that is asked in the exam. So when you see an ECG, see that which class it belongs and then try to differentiate what is happening there, okay? So these are the things you need to uh, read at least this, this much of knowledge and you should be able to identify these rhythms. Um, then they can ask you some questions about cardiac biomarkers and investigation, role of troponin, should have some idea about it, how you use troponin, what is the role of troponin in critical care in non-cardiac patient, uh, what is the role of BNP, and what are the situations where you can have a spurious rise of BNP, spurious rise of troponin, and all those questions around, um, around cardiac biomarkers. Then um, investigations, they can show you slides or pictures of uh, cardiac echo, which includes the basic views. They can ask you to identify the structure, which is the aorta, how do you differentiate the aorta in a, uh, and, or differentiate a tamponade from a pleural effusion or a pericardial effusion from a pleural effusion, what are the signs in there, how, what signs you see in pulmonary embolism, how do you define RV dysfunction, severe LV dysfunction, uh, Takatsubo cardiomyopathy, uh, IVC variation, and how do you uh, conclude that whether the patient is fluid responsive or not. So these are the things they can ask about echo. So you need to know about because there is a station on echo also uh, that, that you may be asked for. Um, then management part. So management of right heart failure, left heart failure, pulmonary edema, pulmonary embolism, very, very important pulmonary embolism. You should be thorough about how do you manage a patient of pulmonary embolism, then classify your answer, hemodynamically stable, unstable. Um, severe P or um, massive P, submassive P, and trials around it. What are the trials suggesting the evidence behind it? Um, bread and butter question for uh, cardiac. Identify the rhythm, ischemic rhythm. How do you manage STEMI and NSTEMI? And the cardiac arrest, we have talked about that already. The last bottom part is also very, very important. Neuroprognostication after a post-cardiac arrest patient. Very important part. So you need to look at the current guidelines and recommendation around it. The study material is already being provided to you guys. So make sure that you get you read those chapters because that is again a position statement from the ESICM. They are very important document. Uh, talked about that, cardiac arrest, neuroprognostication already. Then drugs, very important in the CBS. They can ask you about a drug. So make sure that you know in and out of all the vasopressors, inotropes, especially the newer ones, mildewinone, levosimendan, you know, know in and out of that, uh, how they act, what is the mechanism of action, where they are used, and little bit of evidence behind their use. Antiarrhythmic classification, which type of antiarrhythmic, where they act, very important. 
and antihypertensive probably not that important in the context of this exam, but definitely the vasopressor, inotropes, and antihistamines are very, very important. You need to know about those drugs. Um, Tapas, can I go through the IABP quickly? Yeah, you can, you can. You yeah. can finish it, then I will start. Yeah, yeah so the IABP, again, they are buck standard question in the exam. IABP have four or five type of questions. So they will ask you where the IABP should sit. Uh, how do you see the position of the IABP on X-ray? Then the abnormal, abnormal waveforms in the X-ray. So IABP usually the balloon is distal to the left subclavian artery or is in. Uh, that's where it should sit on the X-ray. It should be in the second intercostal space. Um, what happens if it is placed below that? So if it is placed below, then it can occlude the renal arteries and other, other perfusion uh, issues like gut, gut ischemia and other, other ischemia can happen. If what, what happens if it is placed more proximally, it can compromise the flow to the left subclavian artery. So that's about the position. Then they can ask you about, uh, somebody was asking in the group where the IABP balloon should inflate. So what it corresponds to, it is the middle of the T wave. That's one group of thought. And I think I'll go with that thought. So it should inflate corresponding to the middle of the T, T wave or the diacrotic notch. That's the exact place where it should inflate. And the deflation happens uh, at the peak of the QRS complex. So if they ask you about particulars of the ECG corresponding to the waveform, which is, I don't expect they will be asking, but you should know about it. Uh, now the abnormalities, there are five, sorry, first of all, how it works. So the goal for using a, a IABP is to increase the myocardial oxygen supply and decrease the oxygen demand, thereby we have a balance. Uh, and the mechanism how the IABP helps is the balloon inflates in the diastole, displacing the aortic, um, aortic blood, both into the systemic circulation and also into the coronary arteries. And the balloon deflates before the systole that decreases the aortic pressure or the afterload. So there is diastolic augmentation and thus improves the coronary blood flow. And also there is systolic augmentation, thus in, improves the LV um, output by decreasing the LV workload or afterload. So basically improves um, or decreases afterload to the left ventricle, improves the coronary perfusion, uh, and uh, improves the balance between oxygen supply and demand, thereby improves the uh, cardiac contractility and cardiac performance. Um, now they can ask you about the indication. I'm not going detail of the indication because there's no point. You need to know a few of them. What are the contraindication? Most important, absolute and relative. They may ask you about few trials, landmark trials, and what they have suggested. So basically, it hasn't shown a mortality benefit in multiple multicentral trial. It can work as a bridging therapy, but it is not a definitive therapy. So that's how the current status of IABP, we use it rampantly in the clinical scenario where it is required as a bridging or supportive therapy to something, either the patient goes for a transplant or goes for a cardiac surgery. Uh, you know, need to know about the trials around it also. Complications, again, you classify your answer. So you can tell while putting the balloon what are the complication? Includes bleeding, injury to other tissues, um, dislodgement of clot, ischemia of the limb, infection, bleeding. I've told about the bleeding. Then I can have a decreased perfusion to the limb, causing um, compartment syndrome. There may be malposition of the of the balloon, causing ischemia to the limbs and ischemia to bowel. The renal uh, perfusion can be compromised. Balloon rupture can cause uh, air embolism. So these are the possible complications that we look for. They can ask you, how do you monitor the IABP? So you tell distal pulses and the compartment on the leg where it is being used and also look at the uh, pulse in the, in, the, in the distal radial artery where it should not be compromised. Both sides, the blood pressure or the pulse should be corresponding to each other. So they can ask you about the monitoring in IABP also. Uh, then, as I told, there are five uh, abnormalities. Early inflation, where it inflates early rather than at the diacritic notch, as you can see, which can lead to increased LV oxygen demand due to increased afterload because it inflates when the, when the ventricle is still contracting. 
There is decreased left ventricular oxygen supply due to decreased diastolic augmentation, diastolic perfusion. There is not much blood going into the coronaries. In a contracting ventricle, the coronaries are itself com uh, compressed. So there is no blood going into the coronaries, which in all leads to decreased cardiac output. Next scenario, they can ask you about late inflation. Again, that can cause delayed uh, balloon inflation results in decreased diastolic augmentation. This results in decreased coronary blood flow. Uh, so early inflation, late inflation, then early balloon deflation, what can it cause? It can, it can fail to improve the left ventricular afterload if it deflates very early. And late balloon deflation can cause increased aortic and diastolic pressure, but thus increases the afterload and left ventricular oxygen consumption. So it increases the afterload to the left ventricle. And the last one, is poor diastolic augmentation, you do not solve the purpose. There is decreased coronary augmentation. So there are five abnormalities, early inflation, late inflation, early deflation, late deflation, and poor diastolic augmentation. And what are the after effects of that? Okay. Bit of pacing. Again, you know how they are coded. So first chamber is the pace. So V is pace, V is sense, and I is response uh, to, to whatever they have sense. So First letter corresponds to the pace chamber, second letter corresponds to the sensing chamber, and this is the response. Uh, there are various combination of the modes. They will ask about sensing. They can ask you, how do you define sensing? So you should have a clear head. Uh, what do you mean by sensing? So make sure that you know the one line definition of what, what, what is meant by sensing threshold. Uh, similarly, they can ask you about pacing threshold. How do you set it? These are all practical questions. So you can, um, uh, you need to know about how to set a pacing threshold. Uh, I talked about the loss of capture. What are the causes they can ask you and how you solve the causes. So it can be due to multiple causes, starting from dislodgement, fracture lead, low cardiac output setting, faulty cable connection, um, changes in the myocardium, the unit may be malfunctioning. You, how do you uh, solve it is to check the cables, increase the stimulation threshold and replace the battery and all those things. So similarly, um, under sensing is an, another 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 com event that can you encounter and how do you solve it? Um, not going into detail of that. Over sensing, again, what it can cause and how do you solve it? You need to know about and loss of output, we talked about that earlier. Uh, pacemaker mediated tachycardia. Traditionally or historically, this was a thing uh, where the AV node senses the uh, back um, impulse as a forward impulse and keep on repeating um, discharging or, or the myocardium takes it as a discharge from the AV node and keeps on contracting. Uh, so it's a pacemaker uh, mediated tachycardia. Uh, nowadays with the newer pacemaker, it's hardly seen, but how, what are the possible causes and how do you solve it again? So you need to know a little bit of pacemaker uh, around the pacemaker, epicardial pacemaker that is very important for that exam because if you know, you know. If you don't know, you cannot fake the answer in this case. So it's very high scoring, but at the same time need some knowledge around it, okay? Tapas, I think I'm finished with my presentation. I'm, so, I, I didn't have time you. to go in detail about the pacing because it itself is a two hour class. So it's very hard to um, make understand people if they don't know about it. But I was just highlighting what are the portions they need to study. There are materials everywhere in the net, in the YouTube. We have provided a reading material. So that should be enough to, to go through and have an understanding. We are here to make you understand if you are confused with something. No, Sanat and I agree. Like it's difficult to teach in these sessions. We can only give snippets or tips and yeah. tricks. Uh, maybe, you know, the candidate will have to go and read it up, uh, whether it's... So, you know, I, I totally agree with you. And the way you summarized it, all these points are very important. IABP pacing are all box kind of questions that, that uh, uh, have been asked in the past. So don't miss out on them. As you rightly said, you know, these are uh, uh, easily or easy scoring questions if you know them well. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sananta and Dr. Ramanath for uh, elaborately uh, discussing these points. So now the work 
is much relieved for me because Dr. Sananda has discussed about IABP pacing as well as many things related to the cardiac surgery. So my part would be with the uh, CCS, the second CCS, and that's related to the cardiology. So uh, preferably the examiners, they want to put one cardiac surgical and sometimes they alternate with the cardiology or like it's a, it's a medicinal like case. So my case, uh, just for the sake of a change, I have made it a medicinal like CCU case. So a 52 year old male who is admitted to the ER with a three hour history of chest pain and shortness of breath. He's a type two diabetic and hypertensive on regular treatment. Uh, in ER, the initial GCS is 15 by 15. His vitals in ED are temperature 36 degree, heart rate 145 beats per minute, BP 80 by 50. Peripheral capillary refill is 5 seconds. Respiratory rate is 35 breaths per minute and the saturation is 91% on 10 liters via face mask. Chest auscultation revealing fine crackles bilaterally. So now with this much of information, because you will be getting the uh, Vinet 1 maybe five minutes before your the exam. So you have to make the important points right now in your mind, because that would be leading you to the next clinical Vinet or the, the questions by the examiner. So here, if I would be uh, focusing on the clinical presentation, so it's a 52 year old guy, three hour history of chest pain and SOB and uh, uh, Heart rate is 145, BP 80 by 50. So these significant points you have to just scan by looking at the, uh, the paper, which uh, the examiner would be sharing with you. So it's right now online exam. So definitely you would be getting it in your screen. But when, if you are like planning for the next like November session uh, of your edit two, maybe that time it would be on site. So definitely the, 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 the assessment would be slightly different. But for the time being, like the May session, you have to look at the important points from this, like now the screen itself, like heart rate 145, tachycardic, BP 80 by 50, hypotensive, ref capillary refill is five seconds. So it is right now prolonged and uh, definitely patient is tachypneic with saturation is low. Now there is certain uh, features of pulmonary congestion here in the history itself they have written here. Now uh, you have been given with the ECG here, those who have appeared the test yesterday, so they have already seen this X-ray for the uh, the daily like the, the candidates who are right now online. Uh, so you can check the ECG here itself. So uh, pretty well you can see ST elevated MI, and uh, we would be discussing where is the problem. So we would be going ahead with the clinical vignette itself rather than disclosing the answers. But yes, and this is the X-ray right now in front of you. So with the background of the clinical presentation, the, 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 uh, the examination in the ER and the ECG as well as the chest X-ray. Now we are moving ahead with the first question. What is your provisional diagnosis? So I would be making it very uh, clear that the examiner here wants to know that uh, how confident you are like uh, diagnosing something with a typical case which happens every day in most of the ICUs. If uh, a multidisciplinary uh, intensive care unit is there and you are uh, taking care of patients there, so definitely you should be very clear how you are approaching this type of patient. So your provisional diagnosis, three marks are here for the first question. So your answer should be first one, acute anterolateral STEMI. So the, the candidate may answer like MI also, the candidate may say ACS also, but the answer has to be very short and crisp rather than the, the examiner is slightly uh, not getting the full complete sentence. So you have to make it very clear, acute anterolateral STEMI based on the ECG finding as well as the clinical presentation. That could be also having cardiogenic shock because of the initial presentation with hypotension, capillary refill time is like prolonged. Now, uh, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema based on the chest auscultation as well as the chest X-ray. So these three things would be right now coming in my mind with this much of information given. Now, the second question, what are the diagnostic criteria for AMI? So we have made clearly a very standard case rather than making it very complicated because 
it would test your understanding about one of the clinical case which we frequently encounter in our clinical practice in our training period so if uh, you would be asked about the diagnostic criteria it should straight forward come with the three headings clinical criteria typical chest pain ecg criteria and cardiac biomarker so no uh, relaxation in any of the points because these three are the triad which you have to mention in front of the exam without thinking a lot and without wasting your time because you have a lot of questions which are coming up in the uh, the next clinical minutes now how you classify uh, acute my mi the types of mi so i would be discussing a little bit about mi in my the presentation after this clinical minute or the ccs but for you in the exam it would be straight forward type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 type 5 and uh, we all know type 1 is the ischemic the stemi and stemi type 2 would be uh, the increased oxygen demand supply decrease supply type 3 would be the unexpected cardiac death with symptoms of uh, ischemia and type 4 is due with the pci or stent thrombosis uh, in the cath lab and type 5 associated with the cardiac surgery so you will be getting 1111 straight forward like depending upon the marks set by the examiner but you have to at least mention about these points and 1 2 very clearly you have to mention with the uh, 3 4 5 also now how will you manage so the examination normally uh, flows in this direction provisional diagnosis diagnostic criteria or the the the, the uh, diagnosis method Uh, classification and uh, the management plan so this would be more or less in the first clinical minute so these are the some of the uh, the tricks or the you can say some of the tips from the uh, the uh, the uh, faculty here who have cleared the edic so we have all gone through so normally the questions uh, revolves around these things rather than they would make it complicated in the second or third clinical minute maybe the first clinical minute would be straight forward pertaining to the organ that is involved in the first like the your case rather than they would not directly go to the neurology or complicated like with the cardiac arrest something in the very first clinical minute now what investigation uh, how will you manage this case always always have a structure in your mind rather than straight forward going with the mona straight forward going with the i will go with the pci i would be like handling with uh, the vasopressor i would be intubating the patient so this would like uh, give you a little bit of like the, the examiner would be slightly not very confident that this candidate knows with a proper structure manner and he ha he is slightly like uh, uh, confused at the bedside which organ to or which uh, the part has to be covered uh, in a in a in a step wise manner so that way we always advise in our all the examination preparatory courses always have something in your mind which would make the examiner understand that yes this candidate has worked in the icu for 2 years 3 years or whatever time and definitely the the, the the patient is safe with all the abc management so now for the answer it is abc if you say abc it's almost like clear that yes you are go, like understanding with the airway breathing circulation you don't need to utter about the intubation process the drugs and uh, the uh, the uh, circulation part the vasopressor something like because you don't have enough time in the exam to cover up all these like detail about the simple things that we do day in and day out now the second point would be the specific so it would be initially the supportive or research station part and the second part would be the management which is very specific to the disease what we are now targeting so here we are uh, dealing with the scs so the, it will be primary pci or uh, that you need to tell and then something related to the complications that you have to also manage so you can mention this thing and you will get 111 in each now the next question would be what investigation so uh, the normal the question flow would be related to this pattern so always if you are getting some time before the your real exam in the uh, the ccs 1 or 2 you will be getting 5 minutes time to read the clinical minute 1 but it won't be there for the clinical minute 2 3 4 5 or like whatever the clinical minute because that will automatically be seen in your like uh, laptop when you will be in the real exam so at least 
prepare all those questions that can be asked in those five minutes rather only looking at that page because automatically the flow would be from that page only the first page the clinical minute one so these are the advice from our side that uh, uh, keep something in your mind that would actually save your time and you will be confident in answering and connecting the dots in front of the examiner now what investigation I have, uh, uh, you will do in this case so again structure specific for my case which is your acute mi that is cardiac biomarkers echo abg chest x-ray straightforward along with the blood investigations blood investigation you have to send for the coagulation parameters you have to send for the uh, the normal routine investigations for the uh, maybe patient will be having some urea creatinine elevated so you at least need some blood investigation as well as the abg chest x-ray echo and cardiac biomarker now what are the complications of ami and acs now the question is changing to the real pattern that we encounter in our icu so it won't be a very simple case in any of the exams when we are appearing so definitely the complication has to be again in a structured fashion so you can always tell arrhythmias my patient will be having cardiac arrest reinfarction but yes that would reduce uh, the uh, the uh, uh, significant impact on the examiner that yes you have worked and you have thought about this in a very structured way so again a structure would be coming right now in my mind i can divide into ischemic in this it will be angina reinfarction and the expansion of the existing infarct now the second complication would be electrical and in that electrical you can explain about or the examiner will automatically get to know that yes the candidate is like uh, telling me about the arrhythmias and the uh, heart blocks mechanical which is one of the most common complication and uh, as intensivist we are having a uh, real like a uh, fear in our mind it is cardiac arrest thrombotic and embolic complications heart failure cardiogenic shock mitral valve dysfunction like mr lv aneurysm pseudo aneurysm cardiac rupture septal free wall rupture rv failure lvot obstruction so there are n number of like answers to this mechanical but yes you need to utter about three or four that is mr vst mitral rupture uh, mitral valve dysfunction uh, thromboembolism cardiac arrest now there are certain complications which are delayed like pericarditis and dressler syndrome so with that let's uh, have some of the complications right now the examiner would ask you that after the patient is right now uh, going with the primary pci still he is in persistent shock so what could be the causes for that so again you need to know uh, that persistent or refractory shock despite primary pci so again you divide into acute systolic failure or myocardial stunning post primary pci reperfusion injury one of the most common complication that would lead to the persistent shock status arrhythmia is happening again that is not allowing the blood pressure to rise bleeding is happening so that could be again uh, patient is post uh, procedure complication cardiac tampon had happened because of some procedure again complication septic shock due to all these like handlings and the patient is having like a combination of this cardiogenic as well as septic shock from the very beginning or the patient has developed septic shock during this procedure and hypovolemia again we have to not only focus towards the cardiac part there are many things can happen and the examiner straight forward can ask you that you why you are thinking that you are only working for the cardiac cause there are like all the organs you are looking after so definitely you have to utter about the septic shock hypovolemia and also bleeding now what are the management priorities for this patient when the patient is having persistent shock after the primary pci we all witness this type of things in our ccu so definitely i have to again check the fluid responsive status of this patient i have to start inotrop immediately i have to have some advanced hemodynamic monitoring that would like uh, involve the cardiac output monitoring and at this point of time definitely i would go ahead with the iabp and also the patient's oxygenation is still compromised so i would uh, go ahead with non invasive ventilation or invasive ventilation as per the need so these words are very important rather than you will say that i would intubate i would only prefer non invasive ventilation because 
that means that you will be deciding like subject wise it cannot be like one size fits all so but these are the things right now in in my mind and depending upon the situation i have to change my decision but yes these things are known to me at the bedside anything sir at this point of time dr ramanath yeah. or else Thank yeah you uh, can stay on that page that is so um, yeah. a lot of these uh, answers are specific as tap is rightly said you cannot afford to miss them and there may be some parts of the answers which may not be purely evidence based so you know things like use of iabp in acute mi uh, clearly you know we know rcts have shown no improvement or no uh, survival benefits so uh, even though you are forced to say that you may want to have and this is a trick again you know something which which i i tell my fellows and uh, uh, registrars whenever you present it to an examiner yes you tell them both the pros and cons and the reason for why you use them so essentially you know i prefer iabp in this patient despite the fact that evidence for iabp is um minimal uh, for in acute mi however iabp still remains the most common temporary cardiac support device used uh, in cardiogenic shock so you know you try to you know uh, counter some of these evidences with um, some other facts like you know the frequency with which iabp is used even otherwise despite all negative trials um, and and then you know just keep moving on don't don't stick on to it so i'm just giving you tips only if you are being probed about a particular low evidence strategy which you have mentioned it may not be iabp it can be a particular inotrope that you prefer to use they may go into a particular inotrope which inotrope would you use say you say you start saying dobutamine or adrenaline or whatever you going to use again uh, uh, you should be able to cover it up uh, by saying you know why not some other uh, inotrope if that remains your if that is what the examiner wants to know you can always sum it up by saying you know there is no um, uh, uh, clear cut evidence on which inotrope is the best in cardiogenic shock and then keep it broad all the while okay the other thing i want to tell you i'm sure tapas will be going into it eventually um this again can go into different stems one of the favorite stems with acute mi is cardiogenic shock and um, uh, you should be uh, aware of the acai classification of cardiogenic shock the different stages of cardiogenic shock and the treatment Uh, for each stage so um uh, again before going for the exams make sure that you go through the pyramid uh, the acai pyramid of cardiogenic shock and and uh, revise it um otherwise i think you know tabas has covered most of the things here yes over to you tabas yeah thank you sir so with the background of clinical vignette what we have already men- like mentioned now the second would be the clinical vignette two so yeah so now the patient is in your icu and the patient is having persistent hypotension so you have uh, like right now done one echo uh, we showed no pericardial effusion ejection fraction is only 20% and globally poor systolic function you started on noradrenaline and dose is escalated to 0.2 mics per kilogram per minute despite this the bp is still low and he did not improve on niv and you have uh, put the patient on invasive mechanical ventilation without wasting time so so the answers given by you in the clinical vignet is actually the uh, information which is mentioned in the clinical vignet too so that's the reason that you have to guess what can be the answers you have to like tell in the examination because that will lead you to the clinical vignets 2 3 4 sometimes it exactly happens what you are thinking or because this is a real case normally the edic examination or uh, the the scenarios would be uh, from their own re- like real icus they would not be like made up by the examiners so uh, what we normally do it would be in the clinical page what we, they will show to you now question number 9 would be you have put the patient initially on niv so they may uh, put the question like this how niv help in the management of cardiogenic pulmonary edema three marks every day we put one or two patients on niv because of this cardiogenic pulmonary edema 
so the answer should straight forward come from you decrease myocardial preload decrease afterload it would re expand the flooded alveoli improves the vq mismatch reduces the work of breathing and reduces heart rate by increased parasympathetic tone in response to the lung inflammation by cpap though it would be covering all the mechanism uh, by which niv normally helps but yes the first three things or four things you have to mention in the exam and that would definitely give you the full marks because these are the very straightforward uh, questions and you cannot like uh, take the chance to miss any of the answers now you have put the patient on uh, uh, vasopressors and inotropes you have escalated it now what is your plan of management now despite all the management like to putting the patient on mechanical ventilation and uh, increase the dose of noradrenaline and uh, the inotropes so you would at this point of time as dr ramanathan has told there is uh, you can always say your balanced view the pro and cons are there but at this point of time you have to tell about mechanical circulatory support iabp va ecmo and vad so we know there are many centers that don't have like Uh, bad or like maybe they will not be equipped with all these things but in the examination you cannot afford to lose these uh, important like terms because that would uh, make them understand that yes this this the trainee has worked or at least know about the important points to manage a persistent cardiogenic shock following a primary pci now you have put the patient on iabp because if you will not tell iabp the next question is actually on the iabp so that means definitely at this point of time the examiner wants to know about the iabp now this be the patient put on iabp what are the potential complications of the iabp so already dr sanand has explained about it uh, dr limb ischemia bleeding aortic dissection balloon rupture helium gas embolism so three marks you will be easily get by uh, answering these points now what are the pathophysiologic consequences if the iabp balloon inflates too early look iabp would be definitely coming if you are getting a cc uh, ccs on cardiology or cardiac surgery so we are not going into detail because you have to read it and understand all the troubleshooting it won't be possible to explain about multiple times you have to like uh, draw the pictures or at least look at the diagrams and then you have to clear your concept it's a conceptual thing so if i would explain you you would easily understand now but maybe tomorrow if you will not be getting all those like pathophysiology mechanism and the 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 way ibp works you would be forgetting or in, in the examination you would be confused and you will be just clicking on the whatever is coming in your mind so that is not the right way so we always advise that ibp is a high scoring like uh, domain and if you know it you will be 100% score full marks now what are the indications for va ecmo if the patient is on put on va ecmo at this point of time uh, if the patient is in cardiac arrest failure to wean from cardiopulmonary bypass cardiogenic shock having reversible pathology and as breeze to the heart transplant so uh, two marks are there maybe they can like answer like put four marks here three marks here it's just a rough uh, template but definitely you need to know about the va ecmo in detail because most of the ccu complicated cases they would be asking about va ecmo so along with iabp it is one of the again high scoring domain you need to be like very clear now what is e cpr extra corporeal cpr so you need to tell about this they you need to understand about few concept behind the va ecmo for cpr because that is again one of the right now uh, most utilized thing in certain advanced cardiac centers so uh, with the background of vinet 3 now let's go to the vinet uh, vinet 2 now let's go to the vinet 3 you continued with all your best possible efforts but now things are going out of your hand and this blood like his blood pressure did not improve and suddenly patient developed asystole or cardiac arrest so you continued with cpr return of uh, spontaneous circulation was achieved 48 hours post cardiac arrest sedation was stopped and the patient was still on responsive his gcs is e1 m2 v1 people are equal reactive to light corneal reflex is present is breathing spontaneously on the ventilator and cops on suctioning 
you observe myoclonic jerks. So very important, and we all come across like this type of presentation. And already Dr. Sanand has mentioned in his presentation that uh, the uh, typical cardiac case is right now entering into post cardiac arrest management and neuroprognostication. And uh, uh, the brain death management, or like the patient is having uh, something, they can make the scenario in clinical vignette three, vignette four, as per their own understanding. And uh, you have to know that from here it would go into some neuro part also. So a CT of the brain is right now performed at 48 hours, which is normal. So what are the possible causes uh, of his cardiac arrest? So now it is it could be reinfarction myocardial dysfunction, severe LV dysfunction, pulmonary embolism, valvular rupture, free wall or septal rupture, tamponade, hyperkalemia. Again, we can always mention about the cardiac causes, but there are certain electrolyte changes that can also happen leading to the cardiac arrest. So maybe uh, you need to remember and uh, tell about these points. You will be always occupied with cardiac causes whenever a question is coming from the CCS, which is based upon the cardiac uh, unit one. But you need to also understand about certain complications that can happen also during the procedures, during the ventilation, that is tension pneumothorax. That can be also one of the cause of cardiac arrest in this type of patient. Despite patient is uh, right now post-procedure, but always tension pneumothorax can happen. What are the basic principles of management of a post-cardiac arrest in the initial phase of 48 hours? So yes, you need to mention about things that we normally like uh, uh, practice that is uh, targeted therapeutic uh, like your temperature management, neuroprotective measures, maintain normal physiologic parameters, maintain stable hemodynamics, and family update. Always, always you need to uh, tell about this family update regarding possible poor neuro outcome because the examination is towards the end would be uh, discussing about this communication documentation because now this patient has right now suffered something which is not uh, like maybe the family will not take it easy. So you have to mention about this part. Cause of myoclonic jerks and its prognostic significance, anoxic brain damage. We all uh, have to answer this question. There is no uh, like relaxation that you can miss this type of easy questions. How will you prognosticate to each family at this po moment, point at 48 hours? You have to mention about that, yes, it's a poor neurologic prognosis, but difficult to say at 48 hours. You need to explain the consequence of anoxic brain injury, your uh, uh, future plan of management in next 24 to 48 hours. You need to tell that I need to reassess after like 24 to 48 hours, that is 72 to 96 hours in total. And also you need to discuss about the family wishes and the patients expressed wishes. Though maybe we are discussing it in India, but in uh, European country, uh, though this exam is a European exam, so you need to always uh, respect the patients expressed wishes at this point of time. Now, on day five of the cardiac arrest, the patient remains unconscious. He jerks disappeared, brainstem reflexes are absent. How will you proceed further? So very clear cut, like uh, the flow of the case, you need to explain to the family about poor neurologic improvement and the patient is potentially brain dead because you are now getting the brainstem reflexes absent, the myoclinic jars have disappeared and the patient is still unconscious after five days. You, have, you need to discuss about like provide the ancillary support, including the social worker. Uh, now this patient is actually, you need to subject uh, this patient to the clinical brain death testing, apnea test, and then if clinically inconclusive, you need to uh, consider ancillary test. And if brain death, then you need to involve through the organ donation team to take discussion forward to the next level. So the questions would be related to the organ donation at this point of time. So the CCS related to cardiac is right now entering into a complete card, a separate domain. And the examiner is very fond of asking about the organ donation, then DCD, then like brain death, then clinical brain death testing. The questions can come at this point of time. We have not made it so complicated, but yes, they can ask you related to any of these questions what we are mentioned here. Now, what are the prerequisites for brain death testing? 
normothermia, normotension, exclusion of the uh, the confounding factors like sedative drug effect, normal electrolytes and metabolic state, no residual neuromuscular weakness, ability to examine the brainstem reflex, and ability to perform the apnea testing. So as a general, you need to remember, but in related to this case, maybe you can mention about three to four, depending on the marks. But yes, these are the things you need to remember by heart. Now, something related to the trials at this point of time, name two landmark trials related to therapeutic hypothermia and targeted temperature management in out of hospital cardiac arrest patient. Uh, you need to remember, you need to start with uh, the uh, some of the uh, landmark trials that have been performed. One is HACA trial 2002. I'm not going into detail, but you need to keep the domain of all those trials in the section of uh, the, uh, the therapeutic hypothermia in the cardiology uh, discussion when you are reading it. So HACA trial 2002, uh, then the TTM1 trial 2013, they demonstrated no benefit between the arms 33 degree centigrade versus 36 degree with 72 hours of normothermia post ROSC. Now the Hyperion trial 2019, again, 584% of patients, 24 hours of 33 degree centigrade, then normothermia for 24 hours versus normothermia for 48 hours, demonstrated significant improved neurologic outcome in the treatment plan. So then the TTM2 trial 2021, the recent one, and again, you need to say uh, the, uh, the uh, final conclusion. So all the trials, you don't need to remember everything because in the uh, real edict too, uh, they won't be asking you about the critical appraisal, but yes, the conclusion part, you need to know and uh, wow, it is clinically relevant in your practice. That also you need to sometimes uh, express in front of the examiner. So with this, we have made the uh, clinical unit one with simple SCS MI, and that is complicated in the clinical unit two, three, and finally ending up with the brain death and brain death management. So with this, I would be concluding with the CCS two, Dr. Ramanathan, at this point of time, anything? Yeah, uh, there was a few points I would like to add. Of course, you know, um, uh, the candidates need to know that Tapas has discussed one important stem of the whole uh, scenario, which is a patient who eventually ends up having a cardiac arrest and you evaluating it. Uh, there can be, again, different stems in this regard. Um, the, usually, the usual other stems um, which get discussed as part of acute MI are one, um, uh, the mechanical complications, especially uh, valvular mitral regurgitation and VSD. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those stems which get discussed. Um, the other one is uh, post-MI arrhythmias. Um, and it can, it can, again, you know, move on to anything, including ACLS. So um, you, can, you can see that, you know, even though your stem is very broad, and uh, MI is the topic of discussion. As um, Tapas rightly pointed out, your answers to the questions in Vinet 1 has to be quite broad. Uh, then only, you know, um, you'll, you'll clearly find the transition to other Vinets easier. So uh, you need to be aware that such a broad uh, diagnosis can have various stems. And you may eventually find that, you know, you will start with MI, but you'll end up talking about something else. Um, so be, be ready for that. But all said and done, these are bread and butter cases. You cannot afford to go wrong um, in, in whatever you're going to say. Uh, it's just the way you are prepared for it. Um, and, and of course, you know, it, 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 I'm sure all of you would have seen enough cases of MI that you'll be able to take these questions quite uh, easily during the exam time. Uh, it's just the way of organized thinking that, that makes a difference. Don't panic. Even if there is a tough question thrown at you, I don't know is a perfectly uh, acceptable answer, even though you may not score the marks. But then the strategy here is you're not aiming for one mark out of 20. You just move on to the next. So that's, that's, that's going to be important. So essentially, you know, strategy, strategize yourself uh, make sure that you don't lose your time 
uh, on one question uh, when you are answering questions. Thanks, thanks, Tapas. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ramanathan. So one or two points after this uh, two clinical CCS, like CCS what we have discussed today. Uh, don't say any blunder. Like uh, maybe you can uh, say two answers to like points rather than four points, not in detail fashion, but you will score marks, at least 80% mark, but something which is not acceptable, at least at this point of time when you are entering into uh, like uh, attending uh, in your ICU. And the second point I would be, uh, because I have experienced this, one of uh, the candidate uh, with me during my exam, EDIC 2, the last clinical minute was related to CRRT. Like uh, you are thinking to put the patient on CRRT and in the clinical unit uh, two, the, the candidate uh, did not utter about the possibility or the plan of CRRT and the examiner has kept the clinical unit three on CRRT and there were like five questions related to CRRT. So as the candidate didn't utter about the CRRT plan, so the examiner uh, didn't show only the clinical unit to the candidate because he uh, thought that yes, the candidate is totally clueless about the plan of management for the uh, the patient at this point of time. So you need to always think ahead, what could be the next clinical vineyard, what could be the next options and the complications things, how to like manage that in the real ICU. So two, three important points from our experience. So as many candidates last time also expressed that we need to discuss something related to the CCS, what we are mentioning or discussing in our, uh, the every week, uh, debrief so something related to ami you need to uh, know about the points as dr ramanathan has already told recognize the acute myocardial infraction uh, then the spectrum of acute coronary syndrome you need to be very thorough there is no chance like you can take at this point of time you need to know the appropriate diagnostic tests for your mi and their limitation as well you need to understand the therapeutic approach to the acs Complications and how to manage as we have seen and already Dr. Raman has much told that complications are like the second and third clinical unit. Definitely if you are getting ACS, they won't leave with the typical simple ACS or MI management. Interplay with other organs like what happened in our patient cardiac arrest and that change to the neuro domain. Now, counseling and communication in any CCS from our side as this is the first debrief we would be emphasizing that counseling and communication would always come in the third or fourth clinical unit or last clinical unit and monitoring part basing and advanced whether it is neuro cardiac or nephro definitely one clinical unit would be like uh, involving with the all the monitoring modalities that you have to do at the at your ICU bedside and finally, ICU housekeeping, something related to central line complication, something related to like the patient has suffered some complication due to the negligence or something like that. That can also be asked, nutrition part, that can be asked, something related to the data, they can show and they can like interplay with the different things that can happen in your ICU. Now, I, uh, MI, you need to know about the things. I'm not going into detail, but yes, the definition has to be very clear. You need to understand what is STEMI, what is like uh, non-STEMI, something like that. The universal definition of MI, because there was a question uh, in the clinical unit. So type one, type two, type three, type four, A and B. A is PCI related MI and four B is the stent thrombosis and pipe is the CABG related MI. So not going into detail, but these are certain like uh, things that you need to remember when you are preparing for the case of ACS or MI. Uh, then ECG, you are uh, uh, always like uh, getting one ECG in any of the CCS case. And also it is very helpful in your CBS also. With the CBS, they would, there would be one table that would be only dealing with the corpse and grafts. So in that, you can be asked about all those ECGs Dr. Sananda has mentioned, but in STEMI, what are the indications for immediate reperfusion therapy and what are the typical ECG findings in non-STEMI and your unstable angina, you need to be very thorough. What do you mean by the posterior STEMI? How will you diagnose posterior STEMI? The last time there was one question, straight question uh, asked in the uh, CBS, in the real EDIC 2 about posterior STEMI, posterior infarction. So you need to be very clear. 
what are the locations and uh, the anatomical correlation finding of a different mi and what are the leads so you need to be thorough we are not able to uh, discuss in detail because that will take almost one hour time related to the scs or mi but these are something you need to go through when you are like preparing for your cardiology and cardiac surgery domain then the about the cardiac biomarkers what are the like most uh, sensitive and specific what is the earliest biomarker to be elevated we all know this but yes you need to be thorough your myoglobin troponin it would be elevated large infarction troponin it would may be also non stem if there will be a small infarction b2 you can see here b1 would be related to stemming and ckmb it would be here c and it would be there for 4 to 5 days so troponin i is extremely sensitive and specific for cardiac damage and you can see here elevated level confirms that there is infarction whereas normal level at 8 to 12 hours after the onset of pain is typical uh, you can exclude that there is no infarction so that are the, these are the something you need to remember about this important uh, cardiac biomarkers now yeah uh, then what are the other studies that you need to remember chest x ray abg cbc blood chemistry coagulation study blood type there would be a question related to what are the investigation you would send and in our ccs clinical unit 1 also there was a question then chest x ray why you need to do chest x ray in a case of chest pain uh, to identify pulmonary edema as well as to rule out other causes of chest pain although not a very perfect test a normal mediastinum on chest x ray makes aortic dissection at least leak like least likely and for this reason a chest x ray should be performed prior to thrombolysis so that is again a clinical pearl from our side you need to remember the importance of chest x ray in a case of chest pain and definitely you will uh, do focus at this point of time now there are certain clinical pearls related to the scs management or mi management i am not going into detail but yes the standard door to volume time goal is 90 minutes optimally you can uh, tolerate your patient can tolerate the ischemic time of 120 minutes but you need to like limit it to 120 minutes and the compared to the thrombolysis tci leads to a lower 30 day mortality 4.4 versus 6.5 percent there are also less non fatal reinfarction rate and fewer hemorrhagic strokes uh rescue pci something related to rescue pci then when you would be uh, transferring the patient to the nearby pci like uh, equipped center and uh, when you will be choosing thrombolysis over pci so that are also certain things you need to remember not going into detail now you need to know about unstable angina and non st elevated mi and the approach to the therapy when you will subject the patient to uh, your angiography and angioplasty based on the ecg finding cardio biomarker results timi risk score and whether the patient is likely to undergo early angiography and pci so the management plan also has to be very clear when you are getting you will not always get a stemi maybe there would be a case uh, of unstable angina or n stemi something related to timi risk score we all know there are seven parameters here age more than 65 prior documented coronary artery stenosis more than 50% three or more cst risk factors use of aspirin in the preceding 7 day two or more anginal events in the preceding 24 hours and st segment deviation with increased cardiac biomarkers again importance of mona right now uh, previously it was mona greets all patients but now uh, chest pain mona no longer answers the door so not going into detail but you need to know about the limitations of mona that is your morphine oxygen nitroglycerin and aspirin along with beta blockers when you need to pay, uh, put the patient on beta blockers what are the complications that can happen and when you need uh, fluid in a case of uh, infarction that also you need to know not going into detail again uh, you need to know the complications very clearly mentioned by dr sanand ajula dr ramnathan uh, it's very important you need to divide into the uh, your like answer into a very good structure in front of the examiner and different arrhythmias the complication that can happen 
following MI. So they can show you the ECGs of regular as well as irregular, like having the narrow QRS complex, wide QRS complex, then in the irregular also, narrow QRS complex and wide QRS complex. And uh, ECG is always a favorite topic domain uh, in any exam. Maybe it is CCS or CBS. So you need to be very thorough about the various ECGs that can be asked. Then what are the therapies of proven benefit for MI? So you need to remember these are the slides I'm just keeping for you like uh, to know about the things that you need to remember or read or clear or the concept when you will be uh, like uh, reading three, through the, all those things. They can drag you into IABP already discussed, mechanical circulatory assist devices, VA ECMO, ECMO plus RRT, eCPR, and maybe they can also ask about the heart transplantation. So there are many important articles. This is one article, Management of Intraortic Balloon Pump. You can take the snapshot of this one. Uh, this is very good article, which covers everything almost, starting from the indication, contraindication, the troubleshooting, and uh, different uh, things that can be asked in the intraortic balloon pump. I uh, already discussed in detail by Dr. Sanant. So eCPR, again, one of the things you need to remember, and uh, they can ask you. So with this, I am ending up with the, uh, the discussion related to our CCS. So now the last part I would be finishing maybe in uh, 25 minutes to 30 minutes uh, is the CBS. Anything at this point of time, Dr. Ramanathan? Uh, uh, no, Tapas, I think you, you have uh, summarized it very nicely. Um, uh, uh, I mean, as you rightly said, you know, uh, a, a broad question on uh, coronary syndrome, acute coronary syndrome can lead to any of the, um, the stems which you have mentioned now. So candidates just need to make a note of what all Tapas has gone through and, and uh, be prepared for each of those stems separately. Dr. Sanand, anything from your side? Okay. So no, uh, I think you have covered everything. So yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank CBS, you. Yeah. So the last part, uh, the CBS, again, we will be uh, reiterating the difficult part is CBS. In CCS, you would get something in like in advance, the clinical minute would be given to you, but CBS would be straightforward. You are entering into the different tables and there would be questions, 10 to 12 questions in again, 10 to 12 minutes. So hardly one minute for one question. So uh, we would be making it similar to that again. We have already discussed about this question or discussion. A patient on IBP identify the abnormality, clinical consequence of it. Most of the things we have uh, kept it uh, in our discussion part. So it would take less time to discuss in our CBS in particular. So uh, very clearly mentioned and explained by Dr. Sanand. This is actually happening that uh, the delayed inflation of the IABP balloon. And uh, as a result, the question number two is clinical consequence of it. So it is suboptimal augmentation of the diastolic blood pressure and there is also inadequate coronary perfusion. So the answers would be uh, always having two questions, the problem and the solution. So any question would be if there would be some curves and graphs or any data. So the question would be what is your provisional diagnosis? What is the diagnosis and the management? If some complication is there, what is the complication? What is the management? So always it would be having two questions, maybe sometimes three questions, but preferably almost 90% time there would be two questions in a, uh, the, in, a, in a clinical vignette they would show in the CBS part. Now, I have kept all those things, but Dr. Sanad has covered it. So I'm just keeping it going to the next question. IBP has been discussed in detail, but yes, you need to all go through this and clear your concept because just showing these graphs may not be uh, completely, uh, you can clear your doubts. Now identify the abnormality. How will you manage this? Uh, this is a screenshot or like from our like uh, patient in the ICU, but in the real exam, they would show you like maybe 10 seconds, 15 seconds of video. So because as it is an online exam, so we could not uh, put that video. But yes, with this of uh, this much of information, the question is identify the abnormality. How will you manage this? So very uh, straightforward questions. Pericardial effusion, suspicious of tamponade. 
so with uh, the information that they have just given you one screenshot so maybe i cannot right now say it is clean like uh, your uh, tamponade but definitely it's pericardial effusion and uh, depending on the clinical scenario i would go ahead with the percutaneous pericardiosynthesis so uh, easy question but yes you need to know about the different interventions and the complication that can happen they can keep this picture post uh, pci also so it's not that this question would come only in the cbs they can put the picture in the ccs clinical unit 2 or clinical unit 3 with a video also now a patient with a triple vessel disease undergone cabg post op patient is put on mechanical circulatory assist device now the question straight forward is identify the device and identify the abnormality so we have already discussed about uh, the this type of picture in our uh, the ccs1 also the iabp is here we can see here clearly the tip and this is the catheter and uh, what is the problem here the tip displaced upward i will be discussing about what is the normal position in my next slide now you can see here this is the normal position of the ibp tip and uh, if i would go ahead with the diagram showing how the tip should be placed it should be 2 cm from the carina 2 cm from the carina the tip should be lying and if it is there then definitely it is in the correct position but yes you need to also examine clinically but this is the rough diagram that would clear your doubt about where should be the ibp tip now something about ibp everything has been told by uh, dr sananta but one thing related to the position it should be about 2 cm above the carina and uh, the ibp is inserted through the femoral artery and advanced until the distal tip is in the descending thoracic aorta preferably 2 cm distal to the origin of the left subclavian artery so this is the uh, the normal position and the tip should be 2 cm above the carina in a chest x ray this is in the chest x ray and it's a 25 cm long inflatable balloon and there is a, always a radio opac marker which can be used to assess its position so in a case of cardiac surgery or uh, like post intervention in cardiology definitely uh, you need to check the x rays having ivp or not they may not like clearly mention about some cardiac uh, condition but yes you need to know about this device is there related to the carina position these are things already discussed just skipping because many of the students they have mentioned in our group about ibp because it's a hot topic so you need to know everything about ibp now next question is a 56 years male chronic smoker with uncontrolled hypertensive presented to er with acute onset chest pain radiating to back ct scan was done and uh, there is something in this uh, ct scan so very clearly again they can show you a video where you have to scroll down and check the complete video to know where is the problem but in this there is the screen shot is very clearly uh, evident that it is aortic dissection and uh, they would be also mentioning about the management plan so for me at this point of time blood pressure management and depending upon the label i would go ahead with the surgical or like the medical management now the next question is 45 year male admitted to er with acute onset chest pain and shortness of breath for 6 hours and ecg taken in er what is the diagnosis and what is the definitive management so the questions normally come in this fashion diagnosis and management so it's anterior wall mi again you need to be very thorough with the different locations and the uh, territory of uh, different arteries coronary arteries and uh, the ecg manifestation and what is the definitive management for 6 hours acute onset chest pain shortness of breath anterior wall mi extensive infarction so pci now this was already discussed again one related to ibp we have kept three questions related to ibp just to be like make sure that the candidate understand that this is a hot domain in any of the uh, like exam related to critical care not only to edic 2 so what pressure the blue shaded area represent this one and what is the mechanism of action of ibp 
So this area, yeah, like is the improved diastolic perfusion happens into the coronaries at this uh, juncture. This is the balloon inflation time. And uh, what is the mechanism of action of IVP already discussed? Decrease after load. Then there is a drug related to uh, cardiology. It inhibits phosphodiesterase 3 enzyme by decreasing cyclic AMP hydrolysis. It works as an inodilator. So which drug we are talking about? What is its effect on right side of the heart? So already we discussed that uh, drugs are one of the like most important domain related to cardiology. They can ask you something related to that. So the answer here, millennial already explained in our CCS1. And the, uh, the effect on right side is it improves the contractility of right ventricle. And uh, it acts as a pulmonary vasodilator, reduce the after load for the right heart, as well as it's a peripheral vasodilator and also reduce the preload to the right ventricle. So it reduces the after load and also reduces the preload by working both as pulmonary vasodilator and peripheral vasodilator. And it has also lysiotropy action. So in the next question, what is the mechanism of action of this drug? Cardiac surgery unit, definitely you will be asked about something related to protamine sulfate. And what are the two important side effects, any two? So mechanism of action, it's a highly cationic pe peptide that binds to either the heparin or the low molecular heparin to form a stable ion pair which doesn't have anticoagulation activity. So by this mechanism, it is actually antidote of heparin and the ionic complex is then removed and broken down by reticuloendothelial system. So this is the rough uh, mechanism of action of uh, this one important drug used in the, uh, the cardiac cath lab or uh, the uh, cardiac surgical unit. Now, what are the side effects of protamine? Anaphylactic, in that, like you will be mentioning also about the pulmonary vasoconstriction leading to the pulmonary hypertension. Bronchoconstriction can happen. Bradycardia is one of the like the noted side effect of protamine sulfate. It negatively impact on the platelet function interferes with the coagulation factors, decrease thrombin by fibrinolysis. And also you need to know about many other drugs that already mentioned in our CCS1. It's not only, it's just a prototype of two drugs what we have uh, shown in our CBS, but uh, you need to know about the mechanism of action, the side effects and important trials related to the drugs. Some landmark trials you need to remember. Now, uh, one question related to data, uh, like in ABG, you can be asked, 73-year-old male came to ICU post-aortic valve replacement and the CABG, single vessel. His mediastinal drain continued to have high drain output of 500 ml in the first hour. His blood gas, you have ordered and you have got the blood gas like this. And uh, you have asked for an rotem, which will take 20 minutes time. Now, what is the abnormality you can correct to optimize the coagulation at this point of time? You do not have the Rotem report right now, but yes, you can see the ABG findings here and there is some problem you can uh, correct at this point of time. And what is the mechanism of uh, such di disorder post cardiac surgery? So in this type of question, you need to scan the uh, report immediately and uh, see they, are, they may mention about the abnormal things in some highlighted area. But yes, the things that is coming immediately to my mind is the calcium level here. So calcium level is low, hypocalcemia, post-cardiac surgery. So definitely answer is you, I need to optimize the calcium. And uh, the mechanism of such disorder, maybe the patient is transfused uh, with the blood products. And the blood products have been stored there for a long time. So transfusion telesan with the blood product storage. So that can lead to the hypocalcemia and that is the responsible thing for here uh, to have the patient to be having the mediastinal drain continued with the high drain output. Now the same patient, you are getting uh, managing the hypocalcemia, but uh, his uh, rotem report is here attached after 20 minutes. And what is the abnormality you can detect here? And how will you treat it? So if you see, 
there is fiftem there is extem there is intem and there is heptem so or something very relevant here is the fiftem and you can see here a10 mcf they are all in the low range so that is the problem here and uh, you have to mention about the problem by looking at that there is low fiftem and the most probable responsible thing here is the fibrinogen deficiency and you have to correct the fibrinogen deficiency by giving fibrinogen concentrate or cryoprecipitate at this point of time and something related to the fiftem characteristics between the normal fibrinogen level and hypofibrinogenemia i have collected this information from one of the important article if you are getting the mcf ct the clotting time and the a10 and the uh, the values are 7.5 45 and 6 so it is actually low and you are getting the fibrinogen level less than 200 mg per deciliter and in our patient you can see here mcf is 7 a10 is 6 and ct is also the as is also 5 so these are the things that would be making your diagnosis very clear that i am dealing with something related to fibrinogen level low and the management would be uh, replenishing with the fibrinogen concentrate or cryoprecipitate now and one more question related to the clinical examination finding a 70 year old male presented with left sided weakness of the body with right facial droop he also has painful red raised lesions in hands and feet you can see here the picture these are the things right now raised red lesions which have been progressive for the last 3 weeks along with feeling unwell low grade fever generalized malaise and body ache now you have started with uh, systemic prednisolone by the uh, gp for last 2 months for polymyalgia rheumatica without much improvement on auscultation he has a loud pan systolic murmur over the pericardium so they have confused you with the polymyalgia rheumatic and then the steroid use but definitely the most important clinical finding for me here uh, is loud pan systolic murmur so a 70 year old guy with uh, like this type of skin lesions then constitutional symptoms for 3 weeks and no improvement after steroid and you are getting the uh, clinical examination of likely your loud pan systolic murmur so uh, what are the skin lesions consistent with uh, the your clinical diagnosis so something is right now coming into mind is infective endocarditis most probable diagnosis is infective endocarditis because of the clinical findings what i have already mentioned and the skin findings oscillars nod genuis lesion and rot spots in the retina for the above patient what is the indication for urgent surgery that means the infective endocarditis patient when the patient will be subjected to urgent surgery and what is your empiric antibiotic plan so for the urgent surgery in a case of infective endocarditis this is the list of the things you can mention main indication are heart failure uncontrolled infection and prevention of embolization so this is the thing that you need to know but yes there is no consensus for the optimal timing of early surgery european society of cardiology guidelines they classify surgery indications in infective endocarditis as emergent and elective emergent is within 24 hours urgent is within a few days and elective after 1 to 2 weeks of antibiotic therapy so but this is as per the esc but american heart association or american college of cardiology guideline they defines that early surgery occurring during the initial hospitalization and before completion of a full therapeutic course of antibiotic so there are many indications for surgery you need to know though it may not be a very straightforward question in the examination by look, showing the uh, picture of a patient of uh, like a uh, hand you will be asked about the indication of surgery but infective endocarditis case can come in your ccs as well as cbs the empiric antibiotics benzene penicillin flucloxacillin gentamicin plus minus vancomycin so this is a like empiric antibiotic but yes depending upon the culture sensitivity report you need to again uh, narrow down your antibiotic these things have already been discussed by dr sanand i have kept the questions deliberately because yes the pacemaker uh, is one of the again hot domain along with iabp and uh, ecg 
So what pacing abnormality is demonstrated in the above rhythm strip? How will you manage this? So I think after the, uh, the discussion uh, in the CCS one, you can easily say that this is the problem with the capture. It's a capture failure and uh, the management has to be to increase the capture threshold. Minimum you need to keep at two times. So you can see here, it is not capturing. So capture failure. So uh, there are many things like on the surface ECG, you can see the spacing spikes, but they are not followed by the QRS complex. In the event of, if the capture is not happening in the ventricles, so you will not get QRS complex in your surface ECG. And if it is not capturing at the atrial level, you will not uh, getting the P waves in your ECG. So that is related to the capture failure. I have shown you the article where everything related to pacemaker has been mentioned. Most of the things have been mentioned. So in one article, you can go through the details about the pacemaker. Again, you will get this type of thing. The pacing is there, but it is not getting followed by the QRS complex. What pacing abnormality is demonstrated in the above rhythm strip? Uh, like how will you manage this? The question has been set like this. What is the problem? This has also been also discussed in uh, our CCS1. So it is the sensing problem. And uh, you need to decrease the sensitivity threshold because it is not getting like right now sensed properly. So if you decrease the sensitivity threshold, it would be more sensitive. Now something related to uh, VV ECMO. So a favorite domain for the uh, examiner patient on VV ECMO for refractory hypoxia. So there are like uh, drainage cannula, return cannula. So this is darker, this is redis. Now there are certain problems happening in the B and then the C. So what are the problems? The comment on the color of the ECMO blood in the circuit in below defected image like the B and the C. A is the normal. So if I would be uh, commenting upon that, normal is the dark color of blood in the drainage cannula and red color in the return cannula. Now, in this B, it is happening like the dark color blood in both drainage and the return cannula, you can see. And in the C, both the drainage and the return cannula is having red color blood. So what are the abnormalities that is happening? Why, uh, how you will explain these findings? Uh, this is happening because of the hypoxia, both uh, drainage and return cannula, it is dark color. And there is something related to recirculation happening in the C part. That's the reason why the red color blood is in the both drainage cannula and return cannula. You need to know about how to set up the ECMO and what are the things, the troubleshooting related to ECMO as well. Because it is one of the most important intervention happening right now related to the ARDS also, refractory ARDS and also in the cardiac surgery or the cardiology uh, cases via ECMO. So they can be asked related to the poisoning and the poisoning is right now uh, like having a cardiogenic shock as one of its complications. So the patient needs to be put on the VA ECMO. So they can ask everything related to VA ECMO in that clinical domain. Now, one more question is here, a 79 year old female presented to a general practitioner with chest discomfort and flu-like illness. Now, past history is hypertension, controlled with hydrochlorothiazide and captopril. And this patient is having also vaginal thrust history that is treated with ketoconazole. Now, she was also receiving digoxin 0.25 mg daily. And uh, because of the allergic rhinitis and flu-like illness, which was recently diagnosed, uh, she was treated with a non-sedating antihistamine. Now, Suddenly, she experienced a number of syncopal episodes and presented to the emergency department. Clinical examination there showed a well perfused, normotensive patient. Burst of uh, irregular pulses. Now, the ECG is shown to you. And uh, what is the ECG diagnosis here? And what is the treatment? So, you can see easily the history is uh, having with the non sedating antihistamine. Female patient, so definitely this patient is having ECG diagnosis of dorsitis D pointis. And the treatment is first of the antibiotic with a non sedating antihistamine. And as this patient is uh, right now well perfused, normotensive, so you can watch. And maybe after that, the patient will be 
the ECG would be again taken and you can subject the patient to injection magnesium sulfate. Now, 40 year male HR executive comes for routine investigation for insurance. Now, ECG diagnosis and treatment. Here you can see there is something related to the ECG lead reversal. I'm making it very clear here. And you can see here with the uh, lead reversal, actually something related to enthoven triangle. And that is reversed now. And as a result, you can see if you reverse the leads, the lead one becomes inverted and lead two and three, they switch the places. And you can also see the AVL and AVR is also right now uh, switching the places. So there are certain things that can be happening if you are actually putting the leads in the wrong position. And lead AVF is actually remains the unchanged. So these the things you need to remember. The ECG can also be apart from the disease. It is a normal thing. And but due to the uh, the lead reversal, something is happening. You need to identify immediately if you will be shown the picture. Now. 28 years male known carcinoid syndrome presented with vomiting, shortness of breath, tachycardia and palpitation. Now the patient is put on multipara monitor and you are getting the picture like this, the memodynamic monitoring. So where is the problem? You will be getting the picture and maybe you will be confused with the ECG also, arterial line also, PA catheter, some there is some problem or not, but the obvious finding that you can see here is the CBP. And if you uh, check it, you can see it is actually fused. The two waves are actually fused here. And if you will be looking into the history part, it is a carcinoid syndrome, 28 year old male, vomiting, shortness of breath and tachycardia with palpitation. So the finding here is, it's a regurgitant CV wave. And that is suggestive of tricuspid regurgitation, which is a normal finding in a case of tri uh, your carcinoid syndrome. And you can see here the fused C and V waves happening here in the CBP. And that would make your finding that yes, the CBP is touching almost here 75. So that is the erroneous finding that doesn't have any clinical significance, but you need to remember that yes, this is a patient of carcinoid syndrome and you need to be cautious uh, with the fluid therapy as well as the management related to the CBP. So this is one interesting uh, CG I got, uh, CBP I got. So I thought of like sharing with you. So you can see here the magnitude of the CBP. Uh, it is almost looking like a cannon wave. Magnitude of the cannon wave reaching to the 75 millimeter. And you can see here the diffusion happening here. So there are two waves side by side. And you can see it is almost making it a cannon wave. So in tricuspid regurgitation, there is backflow of blood. And you can see that is obliterating the normal X descent in the CBP. And now the C wave becomes accentuated and fuses with the V wave. And both are happening because of the right ventricular contraction. Now, something related to PA catheter. So uh, though we are not using frequently anymore in our ICU, but yes, it is one of the most common hemodynamic monitoring happening in the cardiac surgical unit uh, still. And that's why uh, the EDIC people, they may ask you something related to PA catheter waveforms in your real exam. And in real EDIC one, it is one of the most important domain. You will get at least one or two questions in the EDIC one. So in EDIC two, they may show one of the uh, the picture related to catheter troubleshooting or catheter's normal location. So the question here is, which of the following PA catheter waveforms represent the catheter's normal location? It's related to the usual stuff, but I have just kept kept it so that you will be going through the PA catheter maybe in one or two hour before your real examination. So it just for the sake of our understanding, right atrium waves will look like this, our normal typical CVP waveform. When the catheter is entering into the tip, entering into the right ventricle, you can see here the large waves and that is right now entering into the pulmonary artery, you can see like this. And when it is waging, you will be getting the uh, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure and uh, you can see the typical waveform like this. So you need to remember it in the EDIC one, it is one of the most frequently at, like uh, put the question. So you need to be very thorough related to that. 
So now the last question in the CBS, the 20th question, a 70 year female widowed presented with syncopal attack in the emergency department, presented with cardiogenic shock to your ICU, troponins positive, the patient underwent CAG and uh, uh, the uh, patient had normal coronaries. What is the provisional diagnosis and management? Again, it's very obvious from this screenshot what we have posted here because it's not the video, but in the video and along with the IVC, uh, you can see that there is something related to here apical ballooning happening. Widow patient, uh, normal coronaries, typical presentation of uh, you can say uh, ACS or MI with cardiogenic shock. So the diagnosis is tachosubo cardiomyopathy and the management need to uh, like counsel the patient, then you will need to continue with the inotropes and wait and watch. So maybe the patient will be uh, relieving from these symptoms once you maintain the hemodynamics and uh, the patient will uh, improve. So in short, we try to cover up with the ECG, with the uh, like different, like the typical complications following MI, then the echo findings, then the CVP waveform, PA catheter waveform, data interpretation, ROTEM, ABG. So, or like almost the CBS will be covering up with all those things related to CCS. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Ramanathan, anything uh, related to CBS part? Suppose I think Dr. Ramanathan has already left. He has okay, uh, okay. posted because it is getting late, almost three hours. Yeah. So, and yeah. Candidates, think, anything? Yeah. Uh, we have clarified see, the doubts. Yeah. yeah, most of them have been answered. I can't see much queries from them. They were asking for a detailed discussion on the rotum and uh, pacing, which I have promised them I'll do it in some classes, probably a week or two, I'll prepare something and uh, I will try to take a class on it. So that's the plan. Yeah. So, uh, so in nutshell, if I would be uh, finishing it uh, with two lines, it's a very extensive topic. Definitely a uh, two hours, two and a half hours is not at all adequate to cover up everything. If we would be going ahead with a detailed discussion, definitely we would be losing the interest. And also uh, the concept will not be cleared. But uh, we thought of uh, keeping this debrief uh, very short and crisp. At least you will get to know the important domains and uh, how to approach with the CCS and CBS and how the question normally comes. So that was the idea behind uh, keeping this debrief uh, uh, very short and crisp along with Dr. Ramanathan, who is one of the like practitioner in cardiology and cardiac thoracic surgical ICU. And we hope that uh, this has given you one insight into your preparation because there are almost like right now three and a half months before your real exam. So definitely uh, we have enough time, but uh, yes, it has to be very structured and uh, you need to uh, start the preparation in the right way rather than uh, studying haphazard from like you know, different domains. So that's the reason why we have kept our tricks to in uh, a structured fashion. The important things are coming in the very beginning, like cardiology, the next time, next week, it will be trauma and the toxicology, then the sepsis, then the neurology. And every week we'll be keeping almost 20 questions from the CBS part related to the specific domain. And also two CCS, again, that would be covering up with the most important clinical case that can come from that uh, CCS. And also the articles related to those CCS and CBS or that particular domain, we would be uh, sharing with our candidates so that at least they can go through all those important things before attempting the questions on Saturday, the weekend. And Sunday, yes, as usual, we will be having the debrief next week on trauma and toxicology. So it's not end here. So uh, if you have any queries, you can post in our WhatsApp group also, or you can directly straightforward write to us. We will be definitely helping you out. All right, Tapas, I don't think there are much queries okay. from the candidates. Okay. So okay. thank you. Will... 
we'll stop the session here. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you all. Thank you. Best wishes. Thank you.